This member of the mushroom family, this fungus, is for the moment known only as X. It was discovered barely weeks ago growing in a remote rainforest. Science has not yet given it a name, for science knows scarcely anything about it. But it is felt that X might have one remarkable quality, that it stimulates extrasensory perception, enabling the mind to become telepathic and clairvoyant. Now that's a rather large claim. Is it true or false? The answer to that question took us on a unique and distant journey. We're in Mexico, thousands of miles from our Hollywood sound stages in a place called Mitla, on the very edge of civilization. There are no actors, there's no script. For this psychic report can only be recorded at the moment it happens. Here in the plaza of the kings of Zapotec, here in the antiquity of Mexico, we begin a search whose ending at this very moment of filming, we do not know. We are searching for something far older than these ruins, which, if found, could hurdle ordinary man infinitely beyond his five senses. And now the first step beyond. The first step is a faltering one. We wait day after day for perfect flying weather, for the only way to reach our goal, the inaccessible village of Hukila, is by light plane over trackless mountains. Has he come back yet? No. Well, keep your fingers crossed. This lovely hacienda at the foot of the Dombach Mountains has been here a little longer than we have, but not much. From here, weather permitting, our chartered plane will fly us to a remote mountain village to look for, of all things, a mushroom. But a very strange mushroom indeed, with powers beyond belief. And here are the mushroom hunters, as improbable a group as you will find anywhere. For instance, this is Dr. Barbara Brown, brilliant neuropharmacologist of the University of California at Los Angeles. With her is David Gray, one of the last kahunas of Hawaii, a spiritual leader whose line goes back 900 years and whose quest for knowledge beyond the world of materialism has led him everywhere in the world. And now here, and here with friend, is Jeffrey Smith, a distinguished professor of philosophy and humanities at Stanford University. And now, and mighty important, is our translator, William Upson, a missionary who has lived among the people of our remote village for the last nine years, and the only man in the world who speaks their language. The pilot says he'll be ready soon, John. And last, our forever optimistic, Dr. Andre Puharish, who wrote the astounding book, The Sacred Mushroom. Dr. Puharish's book brought us here in the first place, and in it, he explains how the mushroom seems to have an incredible effect on the power of extrasensory perception. Incredible is the word. We're here for some very specific purposes. We want to know why these people here in Mexico have kept this right so secret for so many centuries but I would say that our prime mission is to explore and examine the biochemicals present in these new mushrooms and find out if they can be of any benefit in this problem of mental disease what Dr. Paharish hasn't told you it is not all as simple as it sounds the last time he was here looking for the mushroom a man was shot and shot at. And another man was uh, driven out of his mind. For a while. El piloto dice que ya. In English, dice que ya means the pilot said, now. The shadows of our two small planes fall on rainforests which hide villages where the 20th century does not exist. And that's the landing strip, chopped by hand out of a mountainside. Missionaries can bring the word of God to this lost world. As we approach, the pilot warns us to grab hold of something and hang on. 
A sudden gust of wind could smash us against the mountain or plunge us into the abyss below. At last we are in the village of Hukila, slogging through mud. Each of us with an odd sense that all the clocks have stopped ticking. We've brought television cameras to people who've never even heard of radio, who've never seen a telephone, an electric light, who've never heard of aspirin, let alone penicillin. But perhaps the sacred mushroom has given them a psychic insight far beyond our deepest explorations. It breaks up to go about its various investigations. Dr. Brown and a missionary nurse named Dean Duggan go looking for the mushroom guarded by armed soldiers because in the past months shots have been fired, machetes have been flashed, and mushroom hunters who came before us have been murdered. Dr. Puharish and missionary Upson begin searching the town for a brujo, a priest of the mushroom cult. But everywhere they go, an iron curtain of silence comes clanging down. Amid much shaking of the head and wagging of the finger, everyone emphatically denies the existence of a mushroom cult. And it is made very clear that if this is why we have come to Hukila, we are not welcome. Our search seems hopeless until Dr. Puharish gets an idea that might help us push open an ancient door. Bill Upson is sent through the village announcing that a free medical clinic is open to one and all. Within minutes, the first patient appears. A little Chitino Indian with a lot of aches and a lot of pains. And then they come in droves. All of them humble. All of them hopeful. All of them grateful. Finally, the mother of a child whom Dr. Puharish has treated timidly suggests that she might help. Kindness and a bottle of vitamins have worked a magic of their own. Sometime tonight, we will have a visitor. Thanks to the help of the sick child's mother, secret arrangements are made, and we are guided to this hidden place to wait. But it is almost midnight before the brujo appears. He has practiced the secret and all but forbidden rites of the sacred mushroom for decades. Rites passed on from father to son for perhaps 4,000 years. But of course he has never performed before such an audience or a camera. Our scientists have prepared test questions to evaluate the brujo's extrasensory perception. But he insists on one condition. To achieve spiritual union, they also must eat the mushroom. However, in the interest of detached scientific observation, he agrees that Dr. Brown does not have to take the mushroom. The rites begin. A strangely aromatic root is burned. Inhaled. The brujo murmurs incantations in Chitina, a language unknown anywhere else on this earth. As our group waits for the mushroom to take effect, Bill Upson questions the brujo. Because of the circumstances, the sound is, of course, far from perfect. I just asked him when we would see something, when something would happen. And he held up his hand to indicate that he didn't want to talk at this particular time. And then silence again as we wait. And then, oddly enough, the first sound we hear as the chemical in the mushroom takes effect is laughter. <laughs> the brujo has just told of an amusing moment from Bill's childhood in Indiana. Indiana, a place the brujo does not even know exists. Now, each of the group tests the extrasensory powers of the brujo. Sometimes he is accurate, sometimes he is not. Well, right in the eyes, the whole rabbit. Uh, will brighten the eyes. Huh. Oh, that's perfect. This means clairvoyance. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> clairvoyance. The following is one moment when he is startlingly correct. Suddenly he turns to Dr. Brown, whom of course he has never seen or heard of before. Very good. No, no, but I like to eat you. Mm -hmm. To eat my butt. 
You're still sick. Kalsia. You're sick in the chest. Kalsia. Your heart. Your heart is sick. Can you ask how specific? No, let's try to get a picture. Is that the EA? Heart rate is changing. Without a moment's hesitation, he accurately diagnosed a personal illness that only Dr. Brown knows about. Our next experience with the brujo in the sacred mushroom comes quickly and unexpectedly. And this time it has nothing to do with scientific investigation. Since it is now common knowledge that we have already witnessed the rite, we are allowed to come along to see a second priest at work, a man named Macedonia who agreed to take the mushroom and listen to the villager's problem. He said his burro was stolen and he wants to know where to find it. In this village of Hukila, the theft of a burro, a man's most important possession, his donkey, is second only to murder. He said three men are involved. Macedonia hardly paused a moment before he named the thieves. Gustavo said he was going to take the three of them to jail tomorrow. But Don Macedonio warned him not to go near the house of Juan and Pedro because they would kill him, but to look for it in the house of Jose. We go with the villager through a valley, across fields, past other villages to the exact spot where Macedonia said the burro would be. And here indeed it is. It's identifying brand clearly marked on the burro's flank. Now perhaps we can understand, more or less, why for 4,000 years, and from one civilization to the next, the sacred mushroom has endured. We have been given a practical demonstration of how it works in the daily lives of this primitive people. Three weeks have passed, and we're a long way from our remote mountain village of Huquila in Mexico. We're also a long way from the secret rites of the sacred mushroom cult. But our search for the truth about the mushroom, that is the truth as we understand it, is far from over. These men are our technical crew who have come with me from Los Angeles to help us continue our search. We've come to the home and laboratory of Dr. Andre Puharish in Northern California. For me, personally, this next step beyond may be a rather large one. This is part of the laboratory and study of Dr. Puharish. Here among his solid and sound books of orthodox medicine. There are also other books. They are written in French, in Spanish, in English. Here's one that says, Mushrooms, Russia, and History. They're written in Syrian, Japanese, all the languages of the world. And they're all concerned with one thing, the same thing, the riddle of the sacred mushroom. Now, when we were in Mexico, the brujo who discovered the stolen burro might have been coincidence. And the other brujo who told Dr. Barbara Brown about her past illness might have made a wild guess. But today, we should be able to prove the case for or against the mushroom, the sacred mushroom, with quite a lot more accuracy. All set now, John. Are uh, those the... Uh those are the mushrooms you brought back from Mexico? Yes. Andre, how many people have you tested since you've been back? You'll be number 26. What about the results? Encouraging. The average of the group as a whole, and the series is quite small, you understand, uh, shows evidence for extrasensory perception after taking the mushrooms. Well, I'm ready. That is, um, I'm as ready as I'm ever going to be. Well, not quite yet. Well, we have to do some control tests first to see if you have any ESP before you take the mushroom. Oh, I see. And these will be done with cards, pictures, and books. I see. Now you just what? sit still there. Who knows I might try to be a, a, a great big psychic without spending by yourself from anything, huh? Mushrooms? Where are you? I'll, uh... Be with you. Oh, excuse me. Now, John, you take your left hand and bring it in here on this first block. There's a row of ten blocks by you. You bring your right hand over and you scan this far row 
and you uh, remain sensitive to any impressions and when you think you're over the uh, card that matches the one your left hand is on you pick yes. it up and move it opposite that card I see scores added up. On that, this test, you got five hits out of 50. On the book test here, you got one out of 16, and you got nothing on the pictures. This is a chance score and shows... It shows, no that shows that the, despite three years without a show, I have uh, what they would call practically no extrasensory <laughs> perception at all. That's what the test well, what do we do now? Uh, now to eat the mushroom. All right, I'm ready. I'm ready. Maybe that'll improve me. <laughs> which ones are we going to eat? These are, you have so many here, Andre. Which, which one is Oh, mine? these are for you. These are... Chew them well when you ingest. Not bad, are they? Tastes just like mushrooms. <laughs> and one more for you. Oh, dry. Now. now we'll lie you down on the bed. Uh, what for? We'll do some physical testing oh. b before the effects of the mushroom take hold. Like what? I mean, what like what effects? Uh, you'll find out. <laughs> well, it's been about 20 minutes since you had the mushroom, John. How do you feel? Uh... Fine, I feel uh, strong, mm -hmm. sort of. You don't. It's kind of hard to. Uh, strong, a sense of uh, a kind of sense of well-being. Is mm -hmm. that? Uh, yes. Some people feel that way. Let's try something. I want you to stand right up here in front of this light. Yeah. Yes. Close your eyes and tell me what you see. Lower your head a little bit. A little more. Now. Oh, I see it. Now I see it. I see so many things I can't tell you. Can't you slow it? Slow it? Now I see like... But I see so many colors that are... Go... Are they pretty? In geometric signs, that now it's like great things. They're magnificent. That's what they are. They're magnificent. I have never been so aware of color. Of color. It makes me quite dizzy. I feel like I would like to dive into the middle of it. Well, we'll try the card test again. Now. All right, same way. Start with your left hand and try to find the one in this row. Another one? Please. It has, uh, it has a great deal of, it has something, a, a 
power of my mo- uh, like like noise. I don't know how to translate that into a, a picture. I, it seems to have uh, that noise and and uh, speed. Pretty good. Would you like to take a look and see what it's like? Mm-hmm. Amazing, isn't it? Only Mac for that reason, yes. <laughs> Andre, uh, before you tell me anything about the, the score, let me tell you something. Mm. That I did feel something sort of profound. No, profound. When touching the pictures, touching the cards, I felt something. I don't know how I did, but the sensation. Well, John, I can tell you it wasn't a delusion on your part because your card scores were 12 hits out of 50, which are significant for ESP. You got uh, 3 out of 16 of the page numbers on the book. And, of course, most intriguing of all was your work with the pictures. You got six adequate descriptions out of eight pictures. It's a marvelous sensation. You know, Andre, I think I understand a little why for so many centuries they have called this mushroom sacred. Now, our mushroom hunters are reassembled here in our studio. Dr. Brown, was our search worth it? Yes, I think so. The chemicals in the mushrooms, I think, will offer us another tool by which we can explore the mechanisms and the capabilities of the mind of man. And that's both sensory and extrasensory. What about you, Professor Smith? Well, John, the more I experience of life in its ordinary and extraordinary uh, aspects, the more I feel like a wide-eyed child reaching for knowledge and life. As for the mushroom, uh, it took me out into worlds I didn't believe existed, far beyond ordinary perception. And yet, even today, they're as real and as important to my everyday life as anything I've experienced. Dr. Puharish? Uh, During our stay in Hukila, I witnessed quite a number of cases of extrasensory perception by the brujos, uh, some of which we could not film, as you know, John. These, in addition to the ones we did film, and the work which we have done since our return, convinces me that the mushroom contains a chemical which is most promising for the further investigation of extrasensory perception. When this program began, the question was, were the claims for the mushroom true or false? Well, for those of us who made the journey, the answer is true. 